Right, here we are where we left off in part one. And if you haven't seen that episode, I recommend watching it to catch you up. But if you just want to get going with it, that's what we're going to do. And what we're going to do next is design the spokes. So I'm going to define a few layout guides. I'm going to lay them out on our shape. And then I'm going to explain how we're going to construct these things. So let's start the clock and define some constants. The first thing we're going to need is a constant of the half spoke width, which is a CG float of 0.025. Then we can define our layout guides. The spoke polar config is equal to a layout guide config of type polar with one ring at 0.78 and 60 segments. Then we've got another one for the spokes, which is a grid config, which is the layout guide config of type grid. And this has a columns at 0.5 minus half spoke width and 0.5 plus half spoke width and rows at 0 0.1, 0 0.25, and 0 0.46. Then we're going to resume and lay them out on our shape. So we have one layout guide here, which is this spoke polar config scaled, remember, by the primary cog scale, we give it a color of blue and a line width of one. We'll duplicate that for the grid one which is going to have a color of red. Duplicate it one more time, and this time we're going to rotate it 120 degrees, like that. Then we're going to zoom in a bit. So we'll make this 1000 with an offset of minus 170 by 60. And then I'm going to move this into our icon view. So we can control showing layout guides with that debug parameter. And let's show them. Stop the clock. What we've got are two layout guides, one of which is repeated. And the grid layout guide is going to determine the width of the spokes. The polar layout is going to help us draw the arc between the spokes. And an interplay between those two guides is going to let us draw a curve from the spokes to the arc. Now I've defined the grid layout in a very specific way. Remember, layout guides don't need to take up the entire frame. They can occupy just a small portion, like I've done here. The advantage to doing it this way is that I don't need to define a separate layout guide for the second spoke. I can use the same layout guide for both by rotating it into position as we go, because it's going to be rotated around the center of the frame. Now, we can, of course, anchor the rotation of a layout guide if we want to, but by defining it like this, we don't need to. So the way we're going to define this shape is we're going to go to the first grid coordinate of 1, 2, then we're going to draw a line to 1, 1 on that grid. Then we're going to draw a curve to 0, 3 on the polar layout. Remember, we've only got one ring on that polar layout, so the index is 0. And for that curve, we have a control point at 1, 0 on the grid, and the second control point is 0, 2 on the polar layout. And then we draw an arc around to the 17th segment on the polar layout. And now we need to rotate the grid so it's in position to supply the points for the other side of that spoke. And then we draw a curve to 0, 1 on the grid using control point 1 at 0, 18 on the polar layout and control point 2 of 0, 0 on the grid. And now we just finish it off by drawing a line to 0, 2 on the grid. And then we're going to repeat that whole thing three times. So start the clock. First thing we need to do is close that shape. And then we're going to lay out the guides. The polar one is the spoke polar config scaled to the scale laid out in the rectangle. We have another one for the grid, which we'll call G. Then we move to that first point, which is 1, 2. We draw a line to 1, 1. And then we need a curve to 0, 3 on the polar layout. Control point one is going to be 1, 0 on the grid, and the second control point is going to be 0, 2 on the polar layout. We're going to show 
control points depending on whether or not we're debugging. We've got to pull in that debug parameter. Okay, so we'll say debug is false. And then up here, we'll pass it in. It's debug. Okay, back down here, we'll need to resume. Now we're going to draw an arc. Path arc. That one will go around the center with a radius of the radius to 0, 0, 0,0 on the polar layout. Right? 0, 0,0. 0. The start angle is going to be the angle to the 0, 0,3 coordinate. And the end angle is going to be the angle to 0, 0,17. Then we need to rotate our grid layout guide. So G is G, rotated 120 degrees. Now it's in position to receive this thing. Path, curve, we're going to go to G, 0, 0,1. First control point, P, 0, 0,18. The second control point is going to be G, 0, 0. And we're going to show the control point like that. Path line G zero comma two. And we're back at the beginning. Now we need to close that subpath. We're going to loop through this three times for something in zero to three. And now we're going to rotate the polar layout 120 degrees. Okay. Right, there we are, fantastic. Let's uh, turn off debug and see what it looks like. Stop the clock. All right, it's looking good. Now we need the hole in the center, we need an inner cog, and we need to put some shading on this thing. Oh, we also need to rotate it a bit. Let's not forget that. Now for the inner cog, we're going to use the same shape as the primary cog, but we're going to pass in whether or not we are an inner cog. In other words, do we need spokes or not? So let's get started and resume the clock. Let's set this back to true. And we'll go down here, we'll get rid of that thousand there, and we'll get rid of that line. And then we'll put in our inner cog with an inner property of true, a scale of 0 0.53, and a debug property of debug. Then we'll take this icon style and move it down. Then we go down to our cog shape. We take in that property. Inner, which defaults, defaults. Resume. And then we say, if we're not the inner one, then we do all of that. else with the center of the rectangle as the center and a diameter width scaled 0 0.72 times the scale. And in this case, we just want to put a circle at the middle, a very small circle, 0 0.04 times the scale. Okay. Then we set debug to false. We need to get a default rotation into this thing. So we'll say that the default angle is equal to minus 30.5 degrees. And then we're going to rotate these things if we're not debugging. Rotate if not debug default angle. We'll do the same for the primary cog. Now, if we resume, we should see that in a rotated position. And now all we do, we use a nice conditional modifier on the shadow to put it on there if we're not debugging. Shadow, if not, debug, the radius of 10, and we'll give it a color of black. 
And actually, there is one more thing. We need to put a color behind this, a color with 0 0.183 white in it. And we'll clip that to the circle. And we'll say that the opacity is only visible if we're not debugging. Stop the clock. That is our icon finished. And doesn't it look terrific? Now, there are a couple of things uh, left to do. Obviously, we're going to be animating this thing because that's exciting. But we also want to think about this rotation because some of you might be wondering, how can I be applying the icon style when I've already rotated it? Because doesn't that return a view? Well, it would return a view if you were calling rotation effect, which is a modifier on view and returns another view. If, however, you're calling the modifier rotation, which is an extension on shape, then that actually returns a rotated shape, which is, of course, a shape. So you can call shape extensions on it, like icon style. Pure Swift UI, on the other hand, uses the same modifiers for both. So you can call rotate and its associated conditional modifiers, and it will return a shape or a view depending on what you're modifying. So, you know, if consistency is important to you, you might want to bear that in mind. But maybe I'm just biased. And shamefully so. So now we know we can rotate it before we actually style the shape. Why are we doing that? Why are we bothering? And the answer is that if we don't do that, what we'd end up with is a rotating gradient on our hands. Remember, we want that gradient to be static and consistent across the entire icon. So if we rotate the shape after we style it, then that gradient will be rotating too. So we want to avoid that. So we're going to rotate the shape before we put the gradient on it. So let's uh, animate this thing and see what it looks like. First of all, we're going to put in an animating property. Animating, we'll set it to false. And then in the on appear modifier, we're going to say with animation, we'll make it a linear one with a duration of 15. We'll repeat forever with an onto reverse of false. And we'll say animating equals true. And then we use it here. Rotate if animating 360 degrees. We'll duplicate that, move it up to here and make that minus. 360 degrees. All right, let's see what that looks like. Press play. And isn't it beautiful? And this is where conditional modifiers really come into their own. I really do think they help communicate intent so much better than the ternary alternative. To drive that point home, let's pull in the debug property to determine whether or not we want to be animating this thing at all. So let's stop that. And let's add it. So I'm going to say if not debug and animating. Simple as that. And we just copy it to the other one. And if you look at the alternative using ternaries, you'll see you're really starting to lose clarity as to what you're trying to achieve. Whereas with conditional modifiers, the declarative nature makes it completely obvious, in my opinion. So now we're done, just for a laugh, let's add another one. We'll duplicate that. We'll say this one isn't an inner one, so it does have spokes. We'll make it 0.3. We'll rotate it by the negative default angle, and we'll make it rotate twice as quickly. All right, let's play, see what we've got. And that is what you call taking an icon to the next level. And I really love the depth we're getting with those shadows. It really feels like you could chop your fingers off if they got too close to the screen. Well, there we are, we made it. And in just under 14 minutes, which I know wasn't the full 15 minutes, so uh, I hope you don't feel too short changed by that. And I hope you liked the new format and that it helped you follow along. And if it did, hit the like button to let me know, which has the happy side effect of helping other people find the channel too. Now, I know it was a long and complex one, so if you made it all the way through, give yourselves a pat on the back. And if you're not already subscribed and you want to see more of this kind of thing, or SwiftUI topics in general, then uh, consider doing that, and that's probably what will happen. If there are any application icons that are close to your heart and you want me to take on, let me know in the comments, and I might just do it. If you have any other comments or suggestions, please leave them below. But in the meantime, thanks for joining me. See you next time.